I want to say Happy Mother's Day once again to our beloved mothers this evening before we jump into the sermon for tonight. And the sermon will be in English tonight, so just a heads up for all of the Russian speakers here. It will be in English tonight. But I hope that you can stay focused and stay along with us tonight as we study the passage for today. The title of tonight's sermon is A Believer's Response to Trials. We're going to be looking at a mother from the Old Testament. A mother whose trial was her wanting to become a mother. Quite ironic for Mother's Day, right? We're celebrating mothers. We're celebrating a woman who really wanted to be a mother. And there was this trial in her life as she tried to become a mother. So if you would please open with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1. We will be covering the entire chapter tonight, verses 1 through 28. 1 Samuel chapter 1. I'd like for you all to stand. I will read. You can follow along with me as we read God's word this evening. 1 Samuel chapter 1, beginning verse 1. There was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved. And her voice was not heard, therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, For all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. 
And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an aphaph of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord for this child I prayed. And the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. You may be seated. When we read this passage, this chapter, we find the story of a woman named Hannah. Now, Hannah was a woman, like I just mentioned before, who desperately wanted a son. We heard multiple times in this passage that the Lord had closed her womb. God put Hannah into a trial. Hannah found herself in a deep trial, a trial that brought her to her knees, a trial that brought her deep tears, sorrow, grief, and she even wept. The truth is that nowadays, many Christians respond improperly to the trials that God places into their lives. Instead of letting God draw them nearer to him, they distance themselves from God. They grow bitter against God. They say, God, this is your fault. God, you brought me here. Why did you do this to me? This is painful. And instead of falling on their knees, instead of coming to God and asking for mercy and grace to endure the trial, they despise God. They turn to other means other than God himself. Medication, some kind of psychology, some form of secular help, but everything other than God. But Hannah responded properly. She responded by falling on her knees by coming to God in her affliction and in her trial. And she responded to God with prayer and through that prayer with worship. The ultimate goal after trials is not simply to fall on your knees and pray, it is then to worship God. And in this sermon, we will examine Hannah's prime example. We will examine how she responded to and dealt with her trial. And by studying Hannah's response to her trial, we will learn how to respond to the trials in our lives, to the trials that God puts us in. Firstly, let's observe Hannah's trial. I'm going to reread verses 6 and 7. Verse 6 reads, And her rival used to provoke her, grievously to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Now, Hannah was one of the two wives of a man named Elkanah. Elkanah was a devout religious man, a devout Jew. He worshipped the Lord constantly, and every year he headed up to Shiloh. Now, Shiloh was the former resting place of the Holy Tabernacle. That is where the Ark of the Covenant was held. That is where people came to worship. And once a year, Elkanah would take his whole family as a devout and pious man, and he would come and he would worship the Lord there. Now, Elkanah was married to Hannah, but he also had another wife named Peninnah. Peninnah had children. Hannah did not have any children. It says that Peninnah had sons and daughters, but the Lord had closed Hannah's Boom. And despite all of this, Elkanah loved Hannah. It says in our text here that even though she was barren, even though she had no children, he loved her so much that to her he gave a double portion. In verse 5, because he loved her more. He loved her more than Peninnah. Now Peninnah purposefully provoked her, purposefully agitated, purposefully picked on her every single chance that she got because she was the mother who had children, the wife who was regarded as a successful wife and mother. Hannah was the failure. 
she was the one who, well, you didn't really make it. You're not fulfilling your purpose as a wife. And she would constantly harass Hannah, it says in verse 7, year by year. This trial went on for years. We read in the text just a particular point in time, but this trial goes on far beyond this text. This trial lasted for years. Hannah was so deeply grieved and dis in such distress that she couldn't even eat. Now, Elkanah noticed her deep sadness and grief, and he wondered, what is it that brought you so low? What has happened to you? And the answer was, it was that Penina had been provoking her so grievously. Penina had just sort of run over her year after year. And you might think, wow, that is so unfortunate. Why did that have to happen to Hannah? The truth is, the text gives us the answer. God let this happen. God allowed this trial to enter into Hannah's life. We read at the ends of verses 5 and 6 the phrase, The Lord had closed her womb. The Lord had closed her womb. This is repeated twice in this passage. And the truth is, God ordained this particular trial in Hannah's life. He let this happen. He closed her womb. The truth is that God is the one who ordains and wills trials in the lives of believers. God is sovereign over everything, and he is certainly sovereign over your trial and your coming trials. God is God over everything, and he allows trials to come over us. Psalm 66 verse 10 reads, For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. Proverbs 17 verse 3 the crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold and the Lord tests the hearts. God is behind the scenes. God controls all things. Nothing is out of his control. All of our trials, everything that happens in this world, everything that happens in your life is under the control of God. God doesn't cause all trials directly but none are outside of his will and control. God is over them all. Now, I hope that tonight when you realize this, this becomes a comfort to you. To know that this is not some sort of chance, something misfortunate or unfortunate that happened to me that, well, it just, it's terrible. It's unlucky. I have a stretch of bad luck. No, in the life of a believer, there's no such thing. Because God is in control of even those very low moments and even those trials. And when you realize that God is actually in control of your trials, this should bring you peace. If you're a believer, this should comfort you. Because you know that everything works for your good. God works all things for your good because he is good. He is a good God. Charles Spurgeon understood that when he stated this, when you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. Now when we look at trials and we see that God is ultimately in control, some people can eject and say, well, then God is the one to blame. God is the one doing evil. He is the one causing mischief and evil in my life and in the lives of all of those who are around me. But the truth is that God allows trials to happen, but other things carry out the act. For example, a very prime example is Job. Job. God himself brought Job into a trial. If you remember the story of Job in chapter 1, did Satan first mention the name of Job? Or did God call attention to his servant and said, Have you seen my servant Job? 
God brought Job into the spotlight. Now, God brought Job there, and he said, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? God brought him there, and he said, Look, this is my servant. But Satan was the one who took Job and caused the real affliction, but only with God's permission. God brought Job, but only Satan was the one who carried out the evil. In Job chapter 1, verse 12, we read that, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. God gave Satan that right. Martin Luther said that Satan belongs to God. He is under his control. Satan does nothing on his own terms. If God allows something to happen in your life, it is because he permitted it to happen. And it happened for a good reason. Not only does God allow the trials to enter our lives, he determines the extent of our trials. He clearly outlines the boundaries of our trials. He said that, to Satan in the story of Job. Again in verse 12 at the end he said in chapter 1 of Job, only against him do not stretch out your hand. He put a direct limit on Satan and said you can never extend that limit. You have no right. You have no power and you are unable to do so. Not only does God control the extent of our trials, he determines the type of trials that are necessary for you. Each one of us has an aspect, has a part of us that needs perfection. We are all very imperfect. Yes, if we are believers, we are saved, but our imperfections are many. And God uses trials to work upon those imperfections. That's why James says in chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Thomas Watson, the great Puritan, stated, Afflictions add to the saint's glory. The more the diamond is cut, the more it sparkles. The heavier the saint's cross is, the heavier shall be their crown. Now, believers, all who are in this room, if you consider yourself a believer here tonight, when you think about the trials that you might be in now or in the trials that will come to you in the near future, do you rest upon God being over it as a comfort or are you terrified? Where do you stand tonight? Are you comforted that God controls your trials? Or is your life out of control because God is not in control of your life? You must understand that your trials are meant for your good. And instead of backing off and drawing away from God and trying to kick him out of your life because he caused this, you ought to draw nearer to him. We learned that from Hannah. Now we look at her response. Hannah's response Verses 10 through 13 read, She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord. There's the answer. What did Hannah do? No matter what the trial did, no matter how terrible the pain was, Hannah was never driven away from God. She fell on her knees. She came to God. The trial moved her to her knees. Hannah prayed that God would look upon her that God would show her mercy and give her strength to endure the trial that she was in. Hannah's prayer wasn't simply a prayer. It was a vow. She vowed to consecrate her son if God would bless her with one. She vowed to give her son away to God if he would give her one, in verse 11. And Hannah's prayer was different. A lot of the times Christians pray in such an empty way. 
where words just come and by the time we say amen, we're almost asleep. The truth is Hannah's prayer was full of life, full of passion. It came straight from her heart. Her prayer was so unique that even though her lips moved, her voice wasn't even heard. Eli stood at the doorpost and he thought that she was drunk. There's something wrong with you. Can you imagine? This priest has seen so many prayers in his life, yet this one has caught him off guard. To the point where he thinks that she must be drunk. What did Hannah do? What made Hannah's prayer so much different than the other ones that he had heard before? It was the fact that Hannah expressed, like verse 16 says, her great anxiety and vexation before God in her prayer. Hannah voiced everything to God in her prayer. She was absolutely genuine with every word. No word went to the wind. No word was just thrown out. It was all genuine. God requires and loves and adores when we come to him in trials with a genuine heart with a prayer that is willing to be absolutely genuine, with a heart that is moving when it prays. And as soon as Hannah prayed, the beautiful result of her prayer appeared almost instantaneously. Hannah received peace. Hannah's face became glad once again after years and years and years of sadness. Now, God blesses those who pray, who come to him with great peace, like Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 tell us. That in verse 7 it says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that was only one blessing. Once Hannah returned home, it says in verse 19 that the Lord remembered her. He heard her prayer. He heard her cry and he opened her womb now oftentimes when we ask god in prayer when we pray to him and we just lay our hearts out god always guarantees an answer he always answers the prayers of his children the truth is even though god answers oftentimes we just don't like the answer it's not that god didn't answer you it's that it wasn't answered how you'd like it to be answered God answered your prayer, it's just, it's not exactly what you want. And God will answer your prayers according to his perfect will. When you come to him in trials, when you ask, when you come to the throne of grace, you will receive a perfect answer. And sometimes it might not be exactly what you like. And tonight... God is calling us to pour out our hearts through prayers amidst our trials. We must bring our deepest cries and pleas to God through prayer. What did Hannah do after she prayed? She worshipped. Worship. Verse 27, For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. After giving birth to Samuel, Hannah's prayer was answered. And in this case, it was answered according to what she desired. Hannah raised up the child. It says she weaned him, which means she brought him to a point where he didn't need to rely on his mother's milk anymore. In a sense, he grew up just slightly. He was still a young child, but he grew up. And she brought him to Samuel just as she has, she brought him to the house of the Lord just like she had promised. And when she came there, she worshiped. When she received her answer to her prayer, she worshiped. Our automatic response to God's work in our lives and to God answering our prayers, whether we like it or not, should and should always be worship. God calls us to worship him when he works in our lives, even if that work is not exactly what we would like. God still calls us to worship. And Hannah fulfilled her vow. 
She consecrated her son Samuel to the Lord forever. She gave her son away. At the end of verse 28, it says, and she, he served the Lord. He served there for his entire life. Now, to all of us who are here in this room tonight, when we look at our lives, where do we find ourselves? When we find ourselves in trials, do we find ourselves running away from God? Or are we instead coming down, falling on our knees and praying to the Lord, opening our hearts, pouring out our hearts? And when God answers you because he promises to answer you, how do you respond? Do you simply forget that God did that? Too lazy to thank God, too lazy to praise him for his work? What is your response? What is your response when God works, when God moves? Do you fall? Do you worship him? Dear church, I hope and pray that today as we look at the example of Hannah, we will learn how to deal with our trials and deal with them properly by coming before God and by worshiping him for what he will and can do in our lives. Let us stand and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this example that we have in Scripture. We thank you for the many examples that we have all throughout your word where so many different people are brought into trials, yet you work in their lives differently. I pray that you would give us the strength to react to our trials properly, that we would fall on our knees and that we would worship and praise you today. May you be glorified through us and in us when we find ourselves in such places throughout our lives. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.